still be close to the normal for the end of September in most areas. The outlook for Sunday and Monday, showers and sunny intervals in most districts, but some longer periods of rain are likely especially in the north. The temperatures will be near to Well, there we end broadcasting in the light programme, not just for today, but uh, as it seems forever. The light programme, that is, well, as it's known now, is closing down. Ten seconds to go before Radio 1, Tony Blackburn, and Radio 2, Paul Hollingdale, stand by for switching, get tuned to Radio 1 or 2, 5, 4, 3, Radio 2, Radio 1, go. Hi there, Paul Hollingdale here, and this is what we'd like to say. Wake up easy, start the day right. When the four networks were launched, Radio 2 was sort of like the old light program, but not. What you've got, almost by accident, in the great lava flow of Radio 2, are all kinds of old programs or new twists on old programs, which are still serving the audience from before 1967. The songs keep going on and on and on to infinity and beyond. Live from home in Perthshire. Here he comes. And as the music goes round, it brings another anniversary with it. A war which began in September 68 years ago. And if this song doesn't bring it all back to you, you weren't there. So think yourself lucky. I'm Mike Bell, and I live here at Low Farm. Um, on the outskirts of the village of Middleton in Suffolk. And our local pub is the Bell Inn. And about a couple of years ago, one of our pub regulars was sitting by the bar listening to the radio and began to try and guess what tunes were being played, and it was Desmond Carrington show. And he asked me what I thought one was, and I got it wrong, and he got it right, so it became a little bit competitive, and one or two other guys began to join in, and there. So now every Tuesday, the hardcore of Madman get there and have a few pints and play this silly game, trying to guess what songs Desmond is going to play next. Roll out the barrel, we'll have a barrel of fun. So here we go. Glenn Miller and his orchestra on one of their Moonlight Serenade broadcasts. 67 years ago, Glenn's regular guest star for the Andrews yeah. Sisters. Hey. I won't send roses or hold the door. We all had an idea of this octogenarian. I mean, we got the idea it's a little homespun that he's playing it in his front room or... We're aware that he's now past his 80th birthday, but we know what he looks like now because he very kindly sent us a photograph. So that now goes up on the bar when we're playing our silly game. The show now goes out live from a farm in Scotland. It started here in 96. Uh, we were allowed to do recordings for the BBC from here and I used to send the recordings down by post to London and they were broadcast by radio too. The reason that there's a studio here is the, I've always had a sort of radio studio to put all my records in and all through my life because I've always been interested in radio. So a studio was put here. When I grew up, I remember being impressed. I could only have been about one or two by a china plate and around the rim were indications of the new-fangled thing called the wireless. But that impressed me, and as I got older, I thought the wireless was something that I ought to get into. And the way I got into it was having uh, 78 records in the kitchen at home and a wind-up gramophone, playing those and announcing them at the same time. My mother thought I was crazy. This song fits the bill 
Or maybe it prompts a call to the bill. From a village away in Leicestershire to London, here I came. I'm Margaret Marks and uh, live in Hampshire. I go horse riding every Tuesday. And I listen to Desmond Carrington on the way home from horse riding. We didn't have television when I was we a young child and uh, always listening to the radio. I, I remember oh journey into space with Lonnie and things. I mean that that dates way back, you know. Tuesday is my horse riding evening. Usually in a rush, lots of traffic, rush up and I'm uh, allocated a horse. Then I have a half hour lesson. And then we put the horses back in their stalls put the tack away. Time I've done this and that, it's about quarter past, twenty past seven, put on the radio and there's Desmond Carrington and his programme. Because it's so eclectic, it's not always old songs, there's some new ones, you know, and uh, um, they're not all serious, they're really funny, you know, and, and of, of different generations as well. And there doesn't appear to be any structure to it, which is nice. I, I think Desmond is clearly a little bit strange. Um, and we just love the way he rambles and t just talks through and we have no idea what's going to come up. If there is any structure, then it, it's passed me by because you just can't tell what's going to happen. It's a very eclectic programme and because of that it isn't easy to put it into a category but uh, Dave Aylott, my valued producer and friend and colleague who does all the technicalities, he builds the programme. Sometimes he chooses some old records which I say, oh, do you don't want that version, you want so-and-so. And he says, oh, but I don't know that one. I say, no, but I do. And they will. Uh, let's, let's I go back to the 40s and the 30s and I grew up that time. David grew up in the 60s and 70s and the two meet in the middle. Oh, yes! <laughs> Here he goes. We build it between us. I can't tell you exactly how we build it. I think it's like writing a novel. You sit down not knowing what you're going to put on the page and suddenly something writes itself. Oh, you, you did know. All right, sorry. <laughs> Well, on a Tuesday, I start getting all excited around quarter to seven, and I get out my trusty bike, and I cycle up the lane, and then turn down the track, and then into the village, and get to the pub about five to seven, so we can get a pint in, and put the sainted Desmond's picture up on the bar, so that we're ready for seven o'clock. And then, uh, the landlord turns up the volume of his rather decrepit radio and we all sit round our table and uh, the game begins. Oh, the basement lot is not a happy one. Another pint and you'll be there. I've got a letter here, it's from Joan Vibraniec. Joan married a Polish airman during the war. They were together for 60 years until he died five years ago. And Joan says, I'm now 82, a great-grandmother, but when I hear this song, I shall be 17 again, falling in love with my handsome, patriotic Polish airman. We get emails now in the last few years from all parts of the world, ranging from deserts, literally in the middle of a desert, to the British Embassy in Moscow, to people in New Zealand. They're all like friends. I don't talk at them, I talk with them. I try to anyway, and they, they react to that in the way that they feel they own something about the programme. And they do, because without them, there wouldn't be a program. That is why when people say to me, well, you would be retired by now, wouldn't you? Because I'm just 81 at this moment. And I say, well, yes, but what about all those people who depend upon me, who write to me when their husbands die, 
and they say, you played a record last week, and I cried and cried, but thank you so much for playing it. There's a tremendous emotional bond between what comes out of here, this studio, and me, and all those people spread far and wide. It's a bond that only radio can make, and I'm very proud and very pleased to be part of it. Tino Rossi with his tender classic version in French of Jacques Bondre. I shall be waiting. Wrong. Wrong. Well, you can bugger off here. Come in here, tell us who it is and you're wrong. I'd find uh, modern music com is very limited, really. I mean, you, you, you can put it on, it's almost the same beat, the same type of voices, you know, it's what's in vogue now. Whereas with Desmond's show, you've, had, you've got the whole gamut of music. His show on a Tuesday just fits into a certain slot. I get in my car, by that time I'm really quite tired, nice and relaxed, driving back across lovely green fields, just listening to the radio. Enjoyable. Oh, <laughs> As I arrive home, uh, there might be a tune on that I'm listening to. So I, I sit out in the car and uh, my husband comes to the door because he's heard me draw up. He's went, what on earth are you doing sat out here? And then I have to rush in. I say, have you got it switched on? <laughs> so, so I've got continuous sound as I come into the house. <laughs> Jeff Love. 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 Full quota for today. Desmond Carrington, live from home in Scotland, in thanking you for having us at your place. Good old. We did okay. We got a we got a creditable ten. We could have done better, but Desmond gave away the easy ones again. Um, but we're, we're, we're happy with ten boys, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Points make points. Hello again, good to have you with us. Nigel Ogden here with this week's edition of The Organist Entertains, or perhaps I should say on this occasion, The Organist and Other Assorted Keyboard Players. Now, the idea for tonight's programme stemmed from... Primarily, The Organist Entertains is theatre organ based, but of course we do include tracks of Hammond organs and church cathedral organs as well. I divide listeners to the programme into two camps, really. Those who are the avid enthusiast and who probably belong to the various uh, societies, preservation societies. And, I mean, they are, yes, they are fanatical uh, about the instrument, about the music that's played on it. But then there's the other camp, the people that I always aim my personal concerts to, and that is the general public. I'm passionate about getting people off the streets into whatever venue to hear music being played on the theatre organ. There we go, you're in the stall, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Penniston Paramount for this, our regular organ concert here, of course, featuring the sound and sight of the mighty Compton organ. And especially those of you I know that are regular listeners to BBC Radio 2 will find this gentleman no stranger whatsoever, because for many years he's been the presenter of that superb programme, The Organist Entertains. So would you please give a big warm welcome to the entertaining organist himself, Nigel Ogden. This particular organ was built in 1937 by the John Compton Organ Company in London. When I was looking around to buy a cinema organ, uh, I played half a dozen or so and tried different instruments. None of them produced the right kind of sound that I was looking for and basically fell in love with this instrument within the first few minutes of seeing it. 
being a 21 year old student at the time, I'd saved my life savings and bought the instrument. Of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It then becomes down to the maintenance of it, etc. And the only way to do that, or that I could afford at the time, was actually to learn the art of organ building. There is a big difference, of course, between church organ music and music played on the theatre organ. This is the sort of typical theatre organ noise that uh, everybody would associate with the instrument, I think. But it can also be a fantastic uh, cathedral organ as well. Listen to this. The music played on the theatre organ was the light music of the era adapted by the organist and played on an instrument which differs from a church organ of course in as much as although it's still a pipe organ so it has all the air going through the pipes but it has a lot of things that you would never expect to find uh, on a church organ like glockenspiels and xylophones and drums and cymbals and and all the real things as well of course not synthesized but you've got real glockenspiels and xylophones and uh, so they're they're much more orchestral instruments and um, and able to play popular music full marching band at your fingertips isn't that fantastic I think the great appeal of the program is music played on the organ. I often think of whenever anybody wanders into a church or a cathedral and the organ's playing, people always stop and say, oh, listen to that. And, you know, people do love the sound of the instrument, be it playing classical music or light music. Obviously, the organist entertains being on Radio 2 is light music based. Quite a few members of my family hail from Blackpool and so trips to Blackpool were regular. I can remember the first time I ever went into the Tower Ballroom. It was in the days when Reginald Dixon, who of course was organist there for 40 years, was still doing his live half-hour broadcasts. And I would be about five, six years old. And uh, at a few minutes before 10 o'clock, this huge hole appeared in the stage of the Tower Ballroom floor. And I can remember asking my dad, what, what's happening? Why is that hole there? He said, oh, you'll find out. And of course, a few minutes later, I do like to be beside the seaside, came out of the organ chambers and up came Reggie Dixon on the organ. And from that moment on I thought, this is absolutely fantastic, I've got to play this instrument. One of the great things as a child went during my musical education was tuning in on a Friday evening as it was then to Friday night is music night and the organist entertains on radio too, two of my favourite programmes of all time. So my, if you want, weekly dosage of cinema organ music was courtesy of Radio 2 and the organist entertains. Well, these two certainly seem to have got it off to a fine art, as you're about to hear, in this arrangement of the famous Badineri from Orchestral Suite No. 2 by J.S. Bach. One of the great things about the organist entertains is it really has moved with the times. In the early days of the programme, the originator, Robin Richmond, of course, featured a lot of cinema organs and also the Hammond-type organ. And then when Robin retired, Nigel Ogden took over as presenter and Nigel, I think, brought it into the 21st century. We still have the sound of the mighty cinema organs, occasionally the sound of the jazz Hammond organ, the occasional electronic instrument and indeed the cathedral organ now. So I think more of a broader spectrum of music is now featured on the organ of Satanis than at any time in its history. Never miss a programme of the Organist Entertains. I heard Nigel's very first broadcast all those years ago, and I've, almost every one I recorded originally. <laughs> well, I like to hear all organ programmes. I went, used to go to the Tower Ballroom at Blackpool before the war, and uh, I'm a member of my own organ society, and I've come here especially for Lincoln today to hear this concert. I always listen to the Organist Entertains. Um, I have done since I've been about eight and my uncle got me into it, really. Uh, and then I've been here, coming here for about 10 years, and I'm 19, so most of my life, really. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it may be the Compton's 70th birthday this year, but as you know, it's also the 40th birthday of Radio 2 this year, so I thought we really ought to take a look back uh, and see what uh, songs were hitting uh, Top of the Pops uh, in that particular year. I mean, it might be a bit of a shock to discover that all these songs that I'm about to play to you are indeed uh, 40 years old. I remember hearing them in my pram, of course. And, <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, uh, I think they'll all be very, very familiar. So a few uh, songs of 1967 coming up. Here we go. <laughs> When I first started playing concerts in the early 70s, I was always very aware that in the audience there was a lot of fairly grey hair or silver hair or white hair or whatever. All these years later, I'm still aware that that's the case, but of course it's not the same grey hair. Those people sadly are no longer with us. But. As the years have gone by, and certainly with the, the advent of being able to hear the programme over the internet and all over the world as well, a lot of response from younger listeners these days um, and people who are learning to play themselves or people who just love the sound of the organs. I think the way we uh, round off each edition of The Organist Entertains is really very much like I've finished my concerts, really, leaving people wanting more. Those programmes like The Organist Entertains, Listen to the Band, Friday Night is Music Night, programmes of a different kind of music which relate not just to musical taste but to the tradition, the family tradition, the school, the work tradition of live performance, they're all still there. Hello, my name's Frank Renton. Welcome to Listen to the Band and the first of two programmes recorded at the 155th British Open Brass Band Championships and their brass on Sunday gala. There are two great competitions in this country. There's the British Open Brass Band Championships and the National Brass Band Championships of Great Britain. They are for the best bands in Britain. Black Tiger are very unique because they're about 152 years old. That he didn't sound as, as nice then, did it? Technically, they're amateur, but I remind people they're only amateur in the same sense of Olympians because these are, are absolutely the very, very, very best. The British Open is one of those contests that would be regarded as the Holy Grail in brass band terms. It's a fantastic competition. We put a great amount of effort in. I can't ever remember being in the house where there wasn't a euphonium there. My father played the euphonium, he became a conductor. Of course, my brother, fantastic euphonium player, and my big competitor for, for this weekend with his own band. But all this rhythmic stuff sounds a lot better, it's a lot stronger. Every rehearsal I'll probably spend at least two hours actually preparing what I'm going to do at night. So I'll record the rehearsal the night before. My wife and I, Alison, uh, will listen to the piece, I'll comment on it and she'll actually type it out as, as, I, as I'm listening and then I go to band to work at it. Okay. Brass bands are the best thing I do. I don't conduct opera and I don't conduct symphony but I conduct a fantastic brass band. When I play sometimes and conduct, I have the hairs that come on the, up the back of my hand just as I'm speaking to you right now, just because I know a brass band is special. We've done some fantastic preparation, but nothing can quite prepare you when you're on a hat trick win, because um, I've never been on one before. Uh, this is a, you know, we've won it the last twice and I'm getting texts, I'm getting emails, I get phone calls to say, you know, how are you feeling, how's the band playing? And you know, I've got to put that really out of my mind because I'm, I'm doing exactly the same preparation that I always do. On the weekend, uh, my brother and I 
uh, will be competing. He's my best friend, he's my brother, but we know that when we go to the competition, we certainly try and get our, our own bands to do so well and win. But I've got to say, if I was fortunate enough to win on the weekend, I know that he would be the first person on the stage to put his arms around me to say, well done. I'd like to think that I would do exactly the same. But on this occasion, I hope we do just have that little bit of edge on it. When we walk into the Black Dyke Band room, it has a big sign. It says, welcome to the world famous Black Dyke Band. And there's another sign underneath it, it says, live in the dream. Living the dream is, is, is the reason we do it. When I'm in the band room, I expect them to walk through the door and forget about the jobs. They come into the band room as musicians. One, two, three, four, five, six bar. That is a monster sound. It's brilliant, brilliant. Too soon. Too soon. Brass bands and brass band contests are just like football. I see myself as a mixture of an Alex Ferguson football manager and Simon Rattle as the great maestro. I wasn't meaning not to play, I just meant less. I worked the band very hard. For every minute of music, I would say that we'd probably practice at least two hours for it. So for this piece of music, we're probably putting over 30 hours of actually ensemble practice together. He's doing a great job, it sounds fantastic. So we're going to do really well on Saturday, hopefully. We have won the, the British Open the last two years, but it's no one's divine right to be, you know, champions forever. Going for the hat trick, I believe that we're putting the work in. The only concern that I do have is that I know that lots of other bands will be doing exactly the same too. Yeah, good. Now then, I'm Mike Harding here with another hour of the very, very best in folk roots and acoustic music. I don't think I could sculpt without the radio, I really don't. It just feels like I've got somebody with me. I'm good. That's Katie Krull from the brand spanking new Linda Thompson CD, Versatile Heart. Linda, you've certainly picked some, some great people working on this CD with you. What did you do? Did you just phone up mates and say, what are you doing? Come on in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Phoned up mates. And um, I'm lucky I've got so many friends who are great musicians. When I was 17, I was... Um sort of uh, had a boyfriend who was in a, in a folk rock band and uh, so I used to go there and hang out and sort of, you know, eye him up and then we went out together and so I started sort of doing the folk clubs with him and going to the concerts that they put on. My memory is they were um, right on places to go, really uh, cool and groovy. It was very fashionable. Folk music goes from little kids of seven-year-old playing the tin whistle or dancing or listening through to the 78-year-old guy playing in a pub in Manchester in the corner or someone like the late Bob Copper singing in his own hometown and then going on to the Royal Albert Hall or the Festival Hall and doing a huge concert there. It's enormously universal music. In the last 10 years, I've taken up sculpture in a big way and I've also taken up the guitar and writing, singing my own songs, performing them. Kathy's going to come up and sing a couple of her songs and I'm going to accompany and so is Phil. Each other's potential is a sweet thing to find. How can you open the eyes of the blind? I started playing the guitar when I was 18. And then the family came along. And everything sort of gets put, put on hold for that. 
So you know, bringing up five children, um, you know. And eventually, when they all got old enough, I picked the guitar up again, and of course, I went to the local folk club. The great thing about the last 10 years has been that we've seen a huge growth in interest in the kind of music I play on the programme, which is everything from Appalachian music, um, Galician bagpipe players, I call it roots and acoustic music. You're listening to Mike Harding and it's time now for our top 10, which this week comes from record shops all over country. It's a music that, you know, is deeply ingrained in my whole being. And there I was being able to spread it and, and let other people that hadn't heard it listen and think, so that's what folk music is. And the number one, no surprise at all, Kate Rosby with Awkward Annie. And from it, this is The Old Man. People's idea of folk music is always, you know, the finger in the ear. And the iron sweater and the beer tanker hanging off his beer belly. People with sandals. Which is crap, it's just terrible journalism when people do that kind of thing, it drives me mad. You know, I do wear sandals, it's true. I ain't gonna work on the factory and greasy up my clothes Ain't gonna work on the factory, got splinters in my toes I think that, that, that well, I hope as well, that music, folk music, roots music and acoustic music is going to go on and on growing for the simple reason that to me it's people's music, it's done purely and simply for self-expression, not just for money. There is a bit of a tendency now to sort of try and package folk as the new rock and roll. There are some stunningly good-looking women and good-looking guys like Seth Lakeman, Kate Rusby, you know, just as two examples. And they are great, but they're also brilliantly talented. Wonderful stuff, that's Seth Lakeman there with Race to be King from an EP called Poor Man's Heaven, which is a sort of a taster of a CD that's going to come out next year. But there are also a lot of very ordinary looking people who are producing fantastic music, and thank God for them. Bottle of wine, nice lighting, um, Mike Harding playing the music that I like. That's my idea night. The Sunday Gala is all about entertainment. But the Open Championships the day before is serious competition. For the last, I don't know, perhaps a dozen years, even more than that, I guess, it's been here at Symphony Hall in Birmingham, which is a wonderful venue. It's, it's a wonderful hall. We're at the position now where everything's in the right place. I told the band the other night, I'm not like a normal conductor in the sense of uh, there are other conductors that over a period of time have been even more successful. But my, my light that is burning so bright to try and create this, this special achievement. As long as I've put the work in and we get a reasonable draw, we've just got our fingers crossed then. Black Dyke will play 15. Everly and Young will play 9. Black Dyke 15. Brighouse and Rastrick 7. Whitburn 17. And YBS 18. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and the best of luck to all of you. I used to play, but not a, I'm not as a player now, purely as a spectator. And what did you used to play? I um, soprano cornet, it a long time ago, not a very good one. <laughs> I started when I was seven, and I did 54 years in the Salvation Army band. I retired four years ago. 
Well, we've both been in it since the age of 12. 10. All oh, right, he's a lot older than me. <laughs> yes, um, it's always something we enjoy coming to, listen to, and participate in. It's like an examination. The question is the test piece. The bands have got to answer the questions, and, and the ones that answer it best are the winners. It's an absolutely jam-packed audience, and so Nick is a good uh, frontman coming over with the audience, he's a really skilled musician and his, his man management is, is first class, he, he keeps them as a team and, and of course he's well aware of the enormity of it today to possibly the hat-trick and there aren't so many conductors that have done that. It is a big pressure for him but he's not shown it yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's no pressure on without this. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exciting time, it's an exciting time because you put all the work in and of course now we've gone through the draw and you can, um, yeah, like that's one I mentioned before. So you're trying to be calm, so all the players can see that you've got calmness. But below the surface, you're certainly pedalling. Once you're ready, they're ready for you upstairs. Thank okay. you. That's me done. It's a bit like going to battle, really. It's, honestly, it just sounds a bit strange, but it's like going to battle. You just got to go on and do it, really. So a bit apprehensive, but uh, hopefully it'll be a good show, and we'll celebrate later on. That's the most important thing. So we'll see you afterwards. See you the other side. They're all in there now, waiting for the last five minutes. We're in sort of zone B plus, and we've got to get into A. We've got to get into A. I understand the competition is fantastic today, and there's been lots of good bands that have got good draws too. Um, we're obviously pleased with ours, and uh, we've got to make sure now that after all the work, we deliver what we can do. You'll always get a band who will rise to the occasion, who may play to the adjudicator's likings in certain tempo or tuning, and sometimes just the general feeling of how the piece has gone. The thing about specialist music is most often what you're getting is live performance. You're not getting something that's canned or something that's been put together. This is real people making real music for real people. I think the brass band sustains itself because at the best level, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean Black Dyke, it can be at any level. When it's good, it's so much fun and so tremendously satisfying. Any better than that to be fair. They, they really worked worked hard and you can see that uh, I did my little bit too. Um, fantastic reception at the end and so um, well, we've just got our fingers crossed now. Um, I wouldn't say that you can, re you can relax at this point because of course um, my brother's band is on right now. <laughs> my brother's band is on right now and of course um, they, they also realise that, that they've got an opportunity at that, at that moment and uh, they're a great band. Back to all of us. Remember, that was a great, great job. A lot of hard work that's done from from everybody, and uh, we've done all we can do. And now, just have a bit of fingers crossed. And no doubt, I'll see you later for a coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
to the adjudicators when you've made... You never know what the adjudicators um, are looking for. If the adjudicators are very technically adept and can read the score exactly and can hear in their head what is written on the page, well then they should be able to hear a technically perfect performance and decide then whether it's also musically valuable. If they can't, well then they're a bit down to what they like and what they don't like. In third place, and they will take with them the Harry Mortimer Memorial Trophy and a cheque for £1,500. Number three, Fordens Richardson. Now we come to the runners-up. In second place, number 15, Black Dyke. <laughs> and now to the year 2007 champions. And they drew. Number 16, Corey. Yeah! You're going to be see, see scenes now that you know uh, normally if, if you're a footballer you get paid millions of pounds. These fellas don't get paid anything, and ladies, uh, and they do it because they love it. They love it. And of course, not forgetting, uh, all recorded tonight, it's going to be shared with everybody throughout the world. Uh, listen to the man has done it again. Lads, can I say a big congratulations? Thank you. Yeah. Radio 2 has always been a station not just of one kind of music. There is a core audience there of people who are dedicated not just to the network, but to specific things about the network. I think it does a, its audience a real service by keeping the niche programmes, because who knows when suddenly all good music could be a crossover genre. I doubt it personally, but you never know. And that's the thing with Radio 2, it's got its finger on all the pulses. This is Humphrey Little. I can go cold, can I on that? Right. This is Humphrey Littleton with the best part of an hour of jazz between now and 11.30. And I think that the first th thing that you could call broadcast jazz happened with um, uh, the, the, funnily enough, the big dance bands. One, two, one, two, three, ha! American jazz had filtered through by the sort of early 30s. I think it was Mark White who started as a producer a show called Radio Rhythm Club. And that put the focus on jazz and it developed into Jazz Club and it uh, had quite a lot of live performances. I did my first broadcast as a player, trumpet player. But when I was about 17, 19, 54, somebody had said, oh, if you're interested in jazz and you live in London, you ought to go to the Humphrey Little Jazz Club. Number 100 Oxford Street, basement. What is now the 100 Club was, it, was called the Humphrey Littleton Club. He played on, on Mondays and Saturdays. And I used to sit Actually, in front of Hump, I should sit on the edge of the bandstand, looking out, with Hump behind me, and the, the band would be playing, and then I'd get up to dance. The whole thing was about dancing. Very good exercise, I guess. Uh, but very hot. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You may have noticed we're being filmed tonight. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, I, I can't quite remember what for, but <laughs> whatever it is, it'll be damn good. And that's how I got into listening to that band. I listened to many other bands as well, but particularly, I like that band. Judged all others by it. <laughs> The title, The Best of Jazz, wasn't invented by me at all. It was invented by a producer on the BBC, I think. So it was called The Best of Jazz, which I never really liked as a title, because the programme that's been on now, is coming up to 40 years, has, uh, has never been a programme to focus on only the best. In fact, quite often, I find it quite fun to play in something which I would call the worst. I'm wired for sound, which is a nerve-wracking thing to happen because I, you know, I, I tend to, I, I stray from my script every now and then <laughs> when I'm telling uh, stories and things like that. So that in, in order that I shan't feel nervous all the way through the first half, let's get it over with. <laughs> Bollocks. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's better. <laughs> now, in a three-of-a-kind section, see how quickly you can identify the quirk that links these three recordings together. First, here's Louis Armstrong in 1931, producing one of his finest ever solos in Sweethearts on Parade. He plays a huge breadth of music. He'll play old numbers going back to the 20s. Stuff recorded a few weeks ago in the whole spectrum. Whether he really likes it all or not, I don't know. There's something uh, humming here. It may be this. Air conditioning, I think. No, no, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got a murmur. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'll put it in the front. Yeah. Thanks, Sally. Okay. Playing trumpet there was Thad Jones, who wrote the piece three in one. No, he didn't. Let's start that one again, shall we? Okay. It's worth repeating, it was damn good. If I didn't slip up occasionally and, make, and give a wrong bit of information, I would invent it in order to get people to write in and feel part of the programme. <laughs> difficult question to answer really. It's, what, it's the same as why do I like chocolate or swimming or anything like that. It's something I don't think one really wants to intellectualize about. It's just an emotional appeal. down to him, I blame him. He's uh, ruined my life. <laughs> we'll be back here again on the, is it? We'll be back here again on the 9th of October. October. <laughs> 2000 and, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, it's Ella Jones, live at LSO St. Luke's here in London, in the company of conductor Roderick Dunk, the BBC Concert Orchestra led by Charles Mutter, two fine singers, Francis McCafferty and Tom Solomon, and the snappily suited Ray Gelato and his band. All assembled, ladies and gentlemen, for your pleasure in our weekly programme of Music for Everybody.
Friday Night is Music Night is a totally unique radio program. I believe that'll be fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so just. I don't think anywhere else in the world exists a program done by one particular orchestra, 52 weeks of the year, rehearsed in record time of about three hours, and for most of its output going out absolutely live. We've been going for about 15 years now, and uh, all our group like it very much. We have no difficulty in getting 53 people to go up there because uh, they are of the generation that like, like classical music. They were giving the Friday nights at, at um, Golders Green Hippodrome, so we uh, organised a group to go up to Golders Green Hippodrome. That's where we first started. It was what we used to call decent music in those days. I remember one night there was a young girl on the viola and she played the William Tell Overture using um, a lemon, and uh, it was excellent. She's no longer with the orchestra, unfortunately. If you think of the um, announcement at the beginning of every Friday night is music night, actually includes the words music for everyone. It is a sort of common meeting ground for people of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all musical tastes. Regulars is, is, is a bit of a cold word. I think to, to the orchestra and a lot of the performers that have done a lot of Friday night is music night over the years, they, they, they actually become like old friends. There have been one or two people where you don't see them for four or five weeks and the orchestra starts saying, I wonder, what, I hope they're okay, you know, I hope nothing nasty's happened to so-and-so. They, they become friends. The audience is every bit as crucial as the orchestra or the solo singers or the guest artists that come on. On the left-hand side here, on the road that goes out to Braddock's Pond, they did an excavation and they found over 600 graves. And it was very interesting because uh, I got quite friendly with the lady that was in charge. And, um, oh yeah. <laughs> we love it because we love classical music. It's not all classical, it follows everybody's taste. It goes right across the board, right from jazz to the other end of the classics. And the artists are usually very, very good. We have a little informal rehearsal with the soloists. Back in the days of knights in armor, there once lived a lovely charmer. Just to check out that I'm going to be doing the right thing for them, um, that we agree on tempos, that we know where the music's going for, for both of us, before we actually get in front of the orchestra. Sailors, fishermen and gobs and whales, she had a most immoral eye. They called her Laura. And there's lots of tunes, you know, that bring back memories. And when you've been a widow for 20 years, you know, it's, it's, it, it really is rather lovely and it brings tears into my eyes sometimes. I, yes, they do bring back memories. Uh, very dim now because uh, as older you get, the worse you get for remembering, oh yes, I remember that, saw that in 1968 or whatever. You know, I'm at the age now when so many things change and this is just something that has it and I love it. <laughs> Invariably, the first time the orchestra will open that music will be four and a half, five hours before the show goes out live. That's a tribute to the speed and the professionalism and the particular skill of this orchestra, the BBC Concert Orchestra. It has developed an extraordinary ability to um, take on board not only the notes and nuts and bolts of the music, but also the style. The music that they're turning out now is nothing but rubbish as far as I'm concerned. And I hate it. <laughs> it makes me have a headache. But then of course I'm a very old lady. <laughs> I interview you have the Museum of London. If you've not been there, you've missed a treat. 
the driver's going by sat now, so we'll probably be back in Gravesend soon. Yes, we've done it in the rehearsal, we've, we've, we've contained it, we've set the parameters, we all know what we're doing, we all know how we want the music to go, more or less. But then when the show happens, something again gets introduced, which is that interaction between me and the orchestra, the interaction between the singers and me and the orchestra, the interaction within the orchestra themselves. Um, it's a very fun show to play. Okay, we're here. And then you add the audience into that, you get something that really fizzes. This is a serious event. This is a proper concert. And the orchestra are there in their dinner suits, as they would be if they were at the Albert Hall or the Royal Festival Hall or any theatre in the country. It's a real concert in the space, but it's also a broadcast. When you think of the uh, type of person that goes, I think you'll find that the average age is uh, well up into their 50s and beyond. If you close your eyes, you'll probably get one of your neighbours uh, accusing you of going to sleep or something. And we don't want that. <laughs> when that red light goes on, there's still that little tingle, that little thrill, because you know that people you can't see all over the country, and these days, actually, with the internet all over the world, are actually listening to this and sharing the atmosphere in the room. The piece that I really remember was that uh, they, we were out one night, they played it together, and it was I'll Always Be In Love With You, and uh, that stuck in my memory now as uh, a most appropriate piece of music because uh, that was, uh, I was always in love with my wife after 42 years of marriage, so uh, that was uh, poignant. BBC's usual standards. Yes, we, we have enjoyed it. on the way home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can listen to Desmond Carrington and all the other shows featured on Radio 2, 88 to 91 FM and digital radio. 